Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name is Dulta Daherty and in this podcast series, I will be speaking to investors, advisors, entrepreneurs and recruiters who are based all over the world and we'll be discussing how to set up, scale and operate a world-class recruitment company. Today's guest is Rob McGee. He's a co-founder at Ingenio Global. They are a specialist in sales recruitment within tech startups and what makes Rob interesting is that he came to our industry quite late on after being involved in the technology sales arena scaling companies and doing all of that and then taking all of those lessons that he learned and trying to tear up the recruitment script He's learned a lot over the last couple of years. and He's brought in some amazing advisors. And in this interview, he'd give me a really honest step-by-step process of what he's learned so far, what he would do differently, what he's up to now, and how they are going to scale this company and become the dominant force in tech sales recruitment in Europe. So really enjoyed speaking to him. And I came away from the interview thinking, wow, I really believe in his vision. Um, And I I was really appreciative that he was so honest with all the things that he's learned and maybe some of the things that he would have done better if he could have done it all again from what he knows now. But that's all part of the learning process that we're all involved in. And that's what makes great interviews. So massive thanks to Rob. And I hope you all enjoy. Welcome, Rob. How are you? Delta, how are you? Third time lucky. <laughs> I love it. Love the, love the technology. Yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, I'm using Anchor, and it is a little bit problematic. I'm probably going to upgrade uh, things, things to include video and a few other things. Like it. The puns. But I'm suffering through Anchor for the meanwhile because and it distributes the podcast yeah. for us on all the channels. So it's really easy on that front, but it can be a bit choppy. And here Well listen, as 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 you become as you become more professional, I guess you need a professional tool. That's right. I know. That well, we're 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 kinda getting into that place. Love so it. It, it it started with this and then we like we went to New York and we got the videos and all done mm. and then we did a few round tables in London and now the the aim will be to you know get a camera crew and go over and do all these in Dublin. Yeah. And uh maybe get a bit of a party going with uh, some agency owners over there. I'll tell you what, that sounds good. We, it does. We 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 like to party. <laughs> yeah, I know Dublin well. <laughs> so Rob your path into recruitment, it hasn't been the standard finish university, this is your first job, somebody somebody says, go on, pick up the phone there, call through the numbers. I've heard that story a thousand times. That's not your story, thank God. Walk me through walk me through how you a- entered into this industry. Yeah, listen, we we uh I, well sorry, I, I took a uh I took a longer route than probably most. So um yeah, listen, I, I'm, I'm, as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm from Dublin, uh, born and bred originally, and 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 I left, uh, I left Dublin on finishing university uh, and went to London, uh, specifically to get into sales. Um, and I guess at the time, you know, uh, this is this is kind of early two thousands. Uh, really wanted to get into technology, um, so so found myself working for probably one of the most brilliant technology businesses going it was a company called Touchbase, uh, and, and they were a systems integrator, mm. very specialized in, in the telco space. So probably selling mission critical voice solutions to banks and call centers and that type of stuff. Yep. So, uh, so yeah, so look, I, I guess I, I went to London to learn how to sell. Um, uh, and like that, that, uh, 
that love still exists to this day. So I guess plenty of people have gone down the recruitment route and, and have learned to sell. And, and I guess I went another route to, to down the technology side of things. I, I think in my experience anyway, I think technology salespeople are they will, they'll be a lot more, won't they, than, uh, than, than your average recruiter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. like, like if you want to have an experiment on this, ask somebody for a recommendation on LinkedIn right now yeah. on an ATS system or a phone system yeah. and you, you you'll you'll be cold called all day long. Yeah. Yeah, look I, I, I think um I think in any industry, Dilty, you know, you know yourself. I mean look in any industry I think, you know, there's guys who do it very well and, and they're trained very well and, and I guess look there's plenty of people who don't do it so well and um I guess look I was really lucky to work for a guy who who built an amazing culture. Uh, it was a very sales orientated or sales focused business. But, but you know, look, there, there was two obsessions that he had. Uh, and one, one, were, one was clients and the other was people, you know, i.e. the people that worked in the business. And, and listen, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's that kind of centric approach that I've picked up, I learned, and, and I've tried to bring with me, you know, everywhere I've gone since, you know, including t- into Ingenio to this day. So you, you've had three core jobs before deciding to go down the recruitment route. Yeah. Well, was, were you running teams in those jobs? Like, what, Could you kind of give us a bit of a snapshot into what your career was like? Yeah, sure. So, so I guess, I, look, I, 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 um, I learned to sell in, a, in an outbound inside sales god it was telesales back then but uh, i learned to sell in a very kind of like a pretty tough environment um i i specialized then in terms of new business or acquisition as a discipline uh, and then i actually then went on a, a guy i worked for many moons ago suggested i go and, and run relationships with you know key strategic clients so i became an account director and look at that stage then i kind of done all the roles in a sales team or function um and i picked up then responsibility for running a sales team that was a a, a european wide sales team and look that the, i guess the big break for me came when that company i was working with uh, got acquired by a, a private equity backed company a company called datapoint and i was asked by the the ceo to go back to dublin uh, where where obviously i was from and effectively pick up responsibility and, and, and ownership for their European business. So, yeah, look, I was 20. During the yeah, yeah, I was 20. I'd just gone 28 years of age, and uh, I effectively became an MD for a business unit that was doing 20 million quid in revenue and had probably, wow. the, yeah, probably the guts of 200 people working in it. Um, and listen, coupled with that, uh, it was a private equity-backed business that, that had two banks, as key majority stakeholders or shareholders. So, um, you know, look, when I... So when who, I see, who were you, who were you an, an answerable to at that, in that job? I worked directly for the group CEO. So it was based in the UK. Uh, and I was, I was one of, I was one of five guys on his, his senior leadership team. Uh, what, when you went into that job, what was that? What what was that like? Like, what was the first? Like, w- was he giving you a mandate on? I need you to do all these things first, and then like take us from X point to 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 Y, or like how did that? Like that that's a big jump from like, managing two to manage two hundred people. I can't even imagine where you start. Like, so well, walk me through that. Yeah, like uh, it was it was interesting actually. I I I I kind of I almost nearly talked myself out of that job because. I felt the jump was probably too big, and uh, Vim, who was who was my CEO at the time, I mean, he he, you know, he said to me, uh, he said, "Look, you know, we're gonna we're gonna work with you on a on a development plan and a kind of a program, coaching, mentoring, and that's going to take six months, and you know, we're gonna we're gonna drop you into it." And um, so, so look, I guess what well, I was really lucky there that they put a huge amount of structure and support around me and a huge amount of kind of coaching and advisory and guidance that basically gave me a huge amount of comfort as well as obviously all of the skills that I needed to go and, and, and kind of be in that position. So, um, 
so yeah so so look i had i had a, had a really really success i mean look my 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 metrics my deliverables everything changed from being you know from being very sales orientated so probably you know gross profit revenue orientated and and everything changed really overnight to being very ebitda or net net profit orientated or focused because really that's what the shareholders in that business at that time uh, that's what they were interested in so what what would like what would your day look like yeah so so i guess probably a, a better way to a better way to to maybe describe it is what did a typical working week look like um, yeah Okay. Yeah, I, I, I did a huge amount of travel. So obviously, you know, we had we had uh, HQ was in the UK. We had businesses in Spain, Germany, France, Italy, Netherlands uh, and, and obviously in Ireland. And, um, you know, look, I was really for, you know, I was I, I had sales guys in each of those countries kind of rolled up to me. So, you know, we were delivering numbers, very, very orientated a couple of days a week on that. Uh, you know, I had I was a couple of days orientated on on you know on being out in front of customers, and and then look, I guess the last day of the week was very very internal internally focused, which was you know looking at the business, working with our finance functions across the across the region, and, and making sure that you know look from a forecasting perspective we were bang on plan. If we weren't, you know, what were the gaps? What did we need to go and do to address? from an opex perspective you know did we have control was anything running out of kilter you know look the typical type of stuff that a an md would be doing but listen big change for me so i went from being very very customer orientated to being you know quite insular i guess and uh but look that's what we had to go and do you know and so you were you effectively a stats man at this stage. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> luckily, luckily enough, luckily enough, there was a finance team in that business of probably what, oh God, probably ten or twelve people. Um, so I had, you know, I had very specialist capability and resource that was significantly better than me in in those areas, kind of doing you know, a whole heap of analysis and reporting and insight. But um, yeah, listen, I mean, uh, like all of the metrics changed for me, you know, almost overnight. How did the, how did the recession affect you? Yeah, again, I, I guess from a, from a European perspective, we were relatively hedged, you know, and I've always worked you know, I've always worked in businesses that are multinational orientated as opposed to being focused on a very specific geography. And if you if you go back to if you go back to 08, 09, 10, you know, whilst things were pretty sick, I mean, things were very, very sick in Ireland at the time and they were yeah. quite sick in the UK. Uh, Spain was, you know, was was on its knees. Italy was pretty sick. But like, you know, the, the northern European geographies, you know, Germany, the, the Benelux region and France, like we just, we didn't, they didn't catch cold in the same way. Um, and if you think about it, again, going back to the type of stuff that we were doing for clients, where we were selling voice, which, you know, still to this day is the really, it's, it's really the only method of real-time communication. Mm. You know, those, those organizations, like voice was absolutely critical to what they did. So we had very few clients kind of turn off service or, or you know, go out of business because, uh, you know, because ultimately what they were trying to do was, was they were trying to stay alive. They were trying to, you know, do different things with their customers, communicate new ways, reduce costs. And, and we did very well off the back of that. So, listen, I don't, I, I don't want to say for a second that it didn't, it didn't kick us, mm. but we, we had an isolated, like, we, sorry, we had a, we had a hedge to i guess some of the contamination that was going on in the market at the time were you able to attract a lot of good talent in dublin i can imagine i can imagine like being a salesperson in dublin during that recession wouldn't have been hard so if somebody could sell something that wasn't centered around the dublin market it must have been an attractive proposition yeah listen i mean like we were able to we were able to pick up guys who you know, uh, again, if I think about specifically the business in Ireland, like we were able to pick up guys that, you know, normally you would never have, you'd never have had a chance of, of getting because, 
you know, clearly look lots of the big, um, you know, lots of the big international businesses that had a focus on the Irish market. Clearly, they were reducing and downsizing and scaling and scaling back. Um, but but look, what I will say to you is, if you think about it, and I go back to 08, 09, I mean, you know, one of our clients at the time was Google. And I mean, you know, Google at that time were probably no more than a thousand users, a thousand employees here in Dublin. I mean, they're now, I think they're six and a half, seven thousand. So like, you know, the recession, whilst kind of things were going down in Ireland in one way, like from an employment perspective in the tech space, particularly like things were kind of ramping up at the same hand. Um, so listen, we, we definitely, we were able to get some really good, interesting people, probably above and beyond the, our capabilities as a, as a business at the time. But um, yeah, listen, it's a tough market to try and keep people here. It always has been. And you bring, you get to a point where you, you guys obviously floated or sold. Did you sold. ride off into the sunset and, and live in an island for a bit? <laughs> I started a recruitment business, too. So what do you think? <laughs> well, so so here, here, here's, here's the, the million-dollar question. Wh- wh- why start a recruitment business? Well, well, actually, what really interesting, actually. So, so you know, data point, uh, that, that business that I was working in. So those guys sold to a UK listed company called Maintel. So again, two great businesses, you know, uh, kind of came together. And I, look, I just just at that point, what I had done, I guess, and, and and the stuff that we had learned more importantly, you know, I had this itch to say, and and look, it comes from my, you know, my dad's a, an entrepreneur, and it's definitely in the family. But I had this itch all the way along to go and do it, whatever it was for myself. But I wanted to do it myself, and. So we, we, we got a bunch of guys together. Uh, so there was there was five of us in total. And uh, so, so, so three, I guess, on one side, two on another side. And we, we started, uh, you know, we got involved in a company called Capstone. And so, again, very similar technology-orientated business in London and Philadelphia. And, yeah, look, I guess the, the, the genesis of that business was trying to really ramp things up from an international perspective, go after a relatively the same market that we were going after when we were in data point, but do, you know, do things, do try and do everything better and everything the right way. And, and, you know, and, and go from there and listen, we had three and a half really successful years at Capstone. That, uh, that, that story kind of came to an end really, really interestingly because three of us on one side, tried to buy the two guys out on the other side. So, you know, we tried to effectively, you know, uh, engineer a, an MBO. And listen, I'm sure as, as your listeners will know, and you probably know yourself, I guess the first time you try and do an MBO, particularly, you know, without maybe some corporate strategic advisors heavily on board, never goes well, right? So yeah. that's effectively what happened in that MBO scenario. So, you know, we, we, we walked away, uh, when I say we, um, again, I go back to, to James Smith and, and my, my, my co-founder here, Lingenio and I, and um, we walked away, well, we, we effectively sold our stake in Capstone at the time, and, and look, that's where the genesis for Ingenio started. Okay, so the two years walk away, and you think to yourself, you know, we could do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. You know, we could go sell it. But this recruitment stuff, anybody could do that, right? That's easy. <laughs> that's that's way easier. We'll take all our network. We're way better salespeople than the recruiters will call us. And we'll have a hundred people within five years and we'll ride off into the sunset again. This time it'll be all our own money and everybody will live happily ever after. You you might have been listening into our brainstorming <laughs> session. <laughs> Delta, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let me tell you, it's never that simple in our game. Uh, listen, yeah. Look, I, I, I think, I think what I will say to you is, right? Uh, you know, when we when we started in Genio, and and again, our intention always was was to use that great experience that we had in the tech space. And, and, you know, be able to go back and, and obviously monetize that, right? So 
I think on day one, our, our, our kind of the light bulb for us in terms of proposition was, right, we want to sell to technology organizations and we want to sell them, you know, we want to sell, uh, you know, expertise, capability, differentiation. And look, you know yourself, um, most people start a recruitment business by saying, you know, I've had a pretty shocking service or experience of, uh, of, of X company or X industry in the past. And I think I can do, you know, we think we can do a better job. And, and look, I think that was definitely, if you think about a very specific place like Telco, that was, well, that was one of the areas that kind of flew up for us. The other interesting area that we, we started on day one alongside the recruitment business was a consulting business, management consulting business. And that was going into probably like smaller startup scale up businesses and saying, we've got 15, 16, 17 years worth of really good experience in this space. And we think we can help you, you know, build a sales team or go into an international market where you've never been or take a new product or, or, you know, come up with a program or a campaign to try and accelerate maybe through channel. Mm. So all the things that are really attractive and interesting to technology companies. And, and we brought that, those two propositions to, 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 to technology businesses. And it was really interesting because actually our first two assignments when we started as Ingenia were two consulting assignments. And our next two assignments were, were recruitment programs to come off the back of those two consulting assignments mm. so i guess you know look we we our proposition worked but interestingly enough we thought that recruitment was going to was going to be the kind of the initial couple of deals or transactions and, and it, it ended up being the consulting way uh, the consulting stuff started first yeah and that that's not I mean, I've seen a lot of companies do that. There's, there's a few companies. Sure. There's quite a few in Australia that do it from a systems integrator's perspective. So they'll, uh, you know, they, you'll know this more than me, but they'll, for anybody else that isn't accustomed to it, they'll, they'll, it's called like staff augmentation, where, you know, they'll run all their IT for them, but then they'll start embedding staff throughout. And I suppose the, the big four do that in, in, fin- in the finance world and all the rest. But mm. then it's the big wins of, the, the the permanent placements on top of that is where uh, is where the extra cream is made I suppose that's it that's it but look I mean again you know I think I think in let's let's keep to I guess what you and I are here to talk about which obviously is recruitment but you know what what the consulting stuff has always helped us do really really well is is get an engagement with people who who own the business you know who who have a shareholding, have a very, very clear handle in terms of vision, direction. And, you know, I think listening to uh, Toby from Harrington Star, you know, talk on, on your podcast a few weeks ago, I thought it was very interesting when he was saying about, you know, the value of professional services firms. And like, if you can, if you can get people to really appreciate like what the impact of, a standout individual or a couple of standout individuals to a technology business are, I mean, look, it's completely transformational. So like that pitch resonates really well with those guys that we're effectively delivering consulting services for. Mm. No, absolutely. So you've worked in the consulting phase. Mm. If you were to come across you, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Um, I think, you know, I think for us, I think one of the things that we we probably, that we probably didn't, that we haven't done well, you know, or haven't done as well as we probably thought we would do, like the, the, the impact of brilliant people in recruitment, uh, I think is is far, it has far more impact in this space than probably well certainly than the technology space that I've seen, uh, and and why is that right? I mean, look, if you're selling technology to a to a client, you know, or you're delivering technology to a client, like part of the heavy lifting is being done by an app, piece of software, piece of hardware, you know, and the other part of the heavy lifting is being done by, you know, a project or program management team or 
an implementation or a dev team or whatever the case may be, right? So, so you've got a hand in hand, like the technology alongside the people. I think in, in, in this space, you know, people are all important and, and, you know, yourself, I mean, listen, you know, clearly, clearly every CEO of a recruitment company would, would love to automate everything. And we'd love, you know, you'd love robotics process automation proliferated right across our business. But like, I mean, look, you, you simply can't happen. So having, having crucial people do the right roles all the way through our business and, and, paying huge overt attention to that i think for us is probably the thing that we didn't do as well as we could have done over the first couple of years and and knowing that what what is your what does your plan look like to to combat that moving forward yeah so so we we've had some brilliant advisors come in and help us um you know over the i guess over our four years from the um, from the recruitment world yeah absolutely because look you got a shout out to anybody what, yeah, listen, absolutely. So, uh, Dan Church, one of the founders of uh, of Hydrogen, um, my own wife, uh, Sarah Owen. She's she's just started uh, Walters People, the the Irish business, and um, I think a really very specific piece a piece of work from an advisory perspective is, is Adam Fletcher, who helped us ex, ex uh, computer people. Um, uh, Adam was working with James Can and, and, and co and Adam helped us on a very specific advisory and transformation piece of work last year and yeah look I think what we've what we've tried to do now with with all of the people that work in in Ingenio is like the intention is, is for every single person in this business to have an equity stake in our business um, and and the rationale for that is we're going to go on a journey and that journey has a defined end point. And we want everyone who goes on that journey to benefit at the end of the journey. So it's a very collective. Yeah, so like an EMI scheme. Yeah, yeah and it, but it's a very collective, like, get on the bus. And, you know, look, this is, going to be a, this is going to be a journey, right? There'll be ups, there'll be downs. But, like, we want you on that bus with us all the way through to the very end. And I think, look, what that's done for us now, Jilt, is it's just, it's, it's stitched people into the DNA and the fabric of Ingenio more so than maybe it has done in, the, in our first two or three years. Yeah. We've worked with brilliant people, but like they've been, you know, they've used us as a, sorry, not used us, but they've used Ingenio as a kind of a platform. Yeah, to, to get say, a job right, in Google. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, or, like they're doing to everybody else in Dublin. Yeah, exactly. So let, let me um, jump back a step. What yeah. I want to I want to get a couple of key points out of you. Um, Dan Church. Yeah. What is what did he come in and give you specifically? Like, if you could think of one thing that he did. Yeah, Dan. Dan was brilliant. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, what you know, Dan was one of four guys that started Hydrogen. I mean, look, they're a listed organization now, and you know, he he's exited the business now. He he exited probably three years ago dan was able to get talk to us about what does the first three years look like you know i mean he he obviously when he did his thing and we did our thing i mean we were we were mid to late 30s and dan was in his early 20s so i mean obviously we were all different lifestyle lifestyles life stages you know and, and that type of stuff but dan was really able to he was able to visualize what those first three years looked like. And, and with that in mind, the, the, did he have yeah. a look at your structure and work backwards and try and get you to tweak anything? Well, we were lucky with Dan in the sense that we brought Dan, like Dan worked for us in the first three months. So actually he was the engineer for a lot of the structure okay. that we put in place. Interesting. So yeah, that was so, so he was, he was stage one. Um, Sarah, my wife. So Sarah's. Uh, you better be nice here. Now, so, yeah, better be nice. Yeah, you're right. Sarah, Sarah started her career at Badenoch and Clark. And oh, Dublin. she's old school, uh, hey? She. she oh is my school. god! Yeah. Does she tell you? Do, yeah. Do, are you allowed to seat with your dinner, or does she take it away if you haven't made your call? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what she thought us right and. 
you know, sorry, she, I, I managed to convince her, obviously, to move back from London with me. And she, she did a long stint with Morgan McKinley. And she's just started with uh, with Walter's people in Dublin this year to basically launch that new practice and proposition that they're building. Across That'll Europe. be their RPO practice. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. So um, that's an exciting project. It is, yeah. Listen, she's she's uh, she's flipping cartwheels out of bed every morning. Um, so yeah, looks very excited. Oh, I'd, I'd tap her up to work uh, with her. Only we had hunt people from Walters all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they breed, yeah, they breed great people. You know that. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. No, listen, absolutely. But look, going back to her. So if you think about her career, I mean, you know what she's done uh, with us and for us is is really looking at the process. You know, and it's 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 about uh, it's about putting in place that kind of it's a mechanical process that, you know, it's it's a bit like a production, a production line. Right. You Absolutely. know, you know, clearly there's there's impact and clearly there's results and there's disappointments. But like if you're following a very strict formal process, then I mean, look, you're not going to go too wild, you know, in terms of too wildly wrong, either either. Up or Let down. me jump into that process. It, with with it with this in mind, is she is she yeah. and she's having a look at this? Is she coming in and saying, "You guys have credibility. We need to build a machine that you can, you know, go in there, win a piece of work, and then RPO it," or is it we're going to run a traditional contingency based model? Yeah, I th- I think um, we, you know, I guess that like we we've been able and 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 uh, based on some of the clients that we work with, we've actually been able to do both. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But I mean, look, I mean, you know, so 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 we have an RPO model, but like it's a baby RPO because I, I've got the same. Here. You know, we've we've just yeah, exactly, those. exactly. So so we've been lucky in the sense that like you know a lot of our clients, you know, they're funded, um, and we don't typically go from a recruitment perspective than the startup route but like it's scale up and growth probably up to 150 200 million quid turnover and those guys are coming to us saying look we've got a very particular project that we need to go and do in london or in berlin or in dublin or wherever and it needs to look like this but like it's not 100 heads it's 25 mm. and it's a three month period so so look that's that's we've been able to really gain from kind of i guess Sarah's expertise and putting those kind of programs together and um but look we're probably going to be we're probably going to be fighting it out on the battlefield now given given where she's at right now well know? they'll just but, they'll um, just scale up won't they that's yeah. it yeah and and i've heard i've heard they're diminishing a little bit on the contingency side so i can i can understand why uh, why they've brought her in to do this it's a yes yeah. It's a good move for everybody involved. Yeah, no, no, and, absolutely. And those type of like the way the another reason why this is a good move is because every person I speak to in Dublin wants to be an internal recruiter. The amount of real salespeople there are thin mm. on the ground. And Agreed. Yeah. To uh, and that's why I don't do like I do work in Dublin. If somebody awesome approaches me and says, "Where's the best place for me to fast track my career?" and then I go, "Okay, yeah. great, we're in. We'll do it." But the point of recruiters that are just using it as a stopgap to get to Google, it, yeah, and and working for Walters people for a year, that's the ultimate stopgap to mm. to get mm. into Google because it's not quite internal recruitment, but they'll have a sales team that'll work it, and then they'll have a delivery team which will be akin to working as an internal recruiter. So I I, yeah. I can imagine they could scale that 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 up massively over the next couple of years yeah yeah listen I, I you know look she she as i said she she started at the beginning of the year and you know so she's done a road show around europe to go and meet the guys and girls who effectively run those those identical practices in you know the netherlands and belgium and france and i mean look the growth that those guys have gone through in those in that in that brand in those countries like it's yeah. frightening you know they, they were discussing but, launching it when i used to work for them i worked for them Okay. I worked with them for three years. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was... Uh, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. there you go. Well, I mean, maybe she'll be a guest another time. She uh, she sounds like an interesting lady. Um, so we've got away without saying anything bad about your wife. <laughs> we can yeah. move on to what you learned off Adam Fletcher. And I'm always fascinated by what different advisors bring to the table. And um, We didn't go down the advisor route, 
Mm. And we've only had access to these people through the podcast over the last year or two. Mm. And it, it's really changed the way that we think of the business and all the rest. So I'm glad to, to speak to somebody who's from day one gone. I don't know it all. Let's get the best people in and we'll yeah. work out what'll work. So, so t- talk to me about Adam Fletcher. Yeah, so I mean, look, Adam. Adam came in and did a six-month piece of work for us. So, so again, look, I guess if you think about consultants, what we like to do is uh, we like to eat our own dog food, right? It's a it's a horrible phrase from that we you know that we've picked up in the tech space. But like, look, we like to we like to buy into the stuff and do the stuff that we we're trying to pitch to clients. So, yeah, listen, we, we brought an expertise in, we bought, I should say an expertise in and, um, you know, Adam spent, he spent a really interesting kind of, and a quite a nervy six weeks in and around our business, both in, in London and also in Dublin, speaking to people, speaking to clients, doing some, you know, doing a lot of analysis with, you know, with our finance, function and our accountants and all that type of stuff and you know there wasn't it was it was it was quiet for that short period of time and you know uh, I always remember James and I having a beer in, in London saying god like what on earth is going on here and he, he 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 was really brutal uh, in terms of the assessment of our business and you know I guess if there was uh, how long ago was this this was uh, this was just over twelve months ago. Okay. Just over what 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 ago. type of feedback did he give you? Well, look, I, I guess what he what he said was, um, you know, from a from a, 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 a like a client engagement perspective, you know, to start positively, our clients loved us, um, and they loved the clarity around the proposition and the engagement, and you know. The, I guess the the insight and the knowledge that you know we were able to bring, and also that we had kind of imparted on the guys that that worked with us and for us. Um. So stuff was good. Candidate stuff was, you know, was reasonably good. You know, we had a, we'd had some kind of up and down, you know, kind of piece of feedback and, and and whatnot on that side of things. But but really interestingly. What he, what he was very very critical of was was two things. Number one was our our vision. So what did the next three years look like? We were pretty good in the year that we were in, but like he was, he was very confused with what the next three years looked like specifically. So that was mm. the first thing, and the second thing was, you know, he was saying at the time, you know, you you look and feel very very small and in terms of the structures in the teams like i can't see them scaling to you know something significant and and if they do it's going to be quite a bit of work to to basically help that you know to 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 allow that scale so uh, yeah look i mean we 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 effectively ripped up the way our business was structured in terms of you know in terms of client engagement in terms of propositions in terms of focus areas in terms Mm -hmm. of geography and also in terms of the, the, the types and sizes of clients that we, we've gone and work with. So, um, and listen, it's, it's it, you know, that piece of work is tough, right? Because it's, it's very, very critical. Uh, it, obviously in a good way, right? But you've got to go into that, like with, re- with a really, really open mind and a very open approach to basically saying, look, the guy here who's doing the piece of work, like you're not having to go. He's trying to help us get to the next stage and the next stage and, and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, listen, what, what we've ended up doing a whole heap of work off the back of it. And um, we lost a couple of people, uh, which which was a shame, you know, because I guess uh, there were people in the business who didn't like what was being said or didn't like the way things were going to be changed to get to that kind of future piece. But you know what? Look, we, we have to look at the bigger picture as opposed to, taking a kind of a very micro approach to things and um i think look here we are 15 months later having had you know a a a, a brilliant year last year and you know q1 for us was a record breaking record breaking quarter so you know the the building blocks are starting to bear fruit yeah it's really interesting i'm i'm 
I always find it like you sound a bit like myself in, in a in terms of being trying to be almost too clever. Yeah. And, yeah. and then that gets a way of maybe there's probably a simpler way of of doing it. It's done before. And I've I've done all this branding and marketing and we've built this massive tent. But when I when I'm analyzing my own numbers recently and, and going through things, we're doing all right, but we don't really have the foundations in place mm. to to make it scale. So we're very much going through a similar process at the moment to do that. And luckily my wife has just joined us yeah. to break my balls a little bit and to tell me to try and stop being too clever and yeah. get uh Get, get get on with it get on with the thing so it leads me to my question well, now that you feel confident what when 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 you were writing when you ripped up the script and you're writing down what is going to be happening over the next three to six years how like how can you go from you're in a head count of of six billers right now is that right correct yeah so you're in a head count of six billers without knowing nothing about your business, not all of them are going to be profitable. Some mm. of them might be really profitable and you guys might be building lots of money yourself. Mm. How are you going to go from this point to working your way out of being hands-on billing over the next period of time? Was that part of the stuff that they, they rolled into a plan or got you to roll into a plan? Yeah, very much so. I, I, I guess, look, you know, um, and you know this better than most, right? I mean, look, the 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 you know, I guess there's a couple of ways, right, that we can we can go and grow. And we've had a look at all these options, right? I mean, we think our proposition right now, interestingly enough, I know a whole heap of the guys that have contributed to to your podcast, like they go to the states, and uh, you know, or they've gone to Asia. And uh, listen, uh, like I'd love a I'd love a New York office, but I mean, I don't see that in the next three years because. Like, I think what we can do is we can become really, really specialist and very, very precise in Europe and, and, and hopefully own that kind of space and be the guys that, you know, be, are really, really famous for working with tech companies across the European region. And, and that's, look, that's my vision for Ingenio. And, we, and, and, and scale is the one thing that's really, because you've, you've got the vision now. Yeah, you've probably got the processes. By sounds like you've probably got loads of processes, yeah. given all that, all those advisors that you've had in, and you've got the credibility and the network. It it sounds like you kind of need to go on a hiring bonanza and be able to attract a wave of people that can contribute. Is that is that what I'm reading? Yeah, you? listen, I think I think so. So that's partially true, but here's the. Here's hopefully the bit that makes us a little more unique, maybe than than others, right? So if you think about, I think you're plenty unique. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I mean, listen. Hopefully, hopefully we're partially, you know. But but what I would say is this: taking our tech background and 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 look, we we probably more than most in this gig, we really understand the impact of technology. And I know you're a huge fan of. I know you're a huge fan of, of you know, of automation and, and kind of outsourcing almost to be really, really focused on, you know, the things, the core key things. Yeah. I my am, yeah. my vision, uh, Jill, for this business is to create a professional services firm whereby it's an upside down triangle whereby most of the people in our business are fee earning and billers. Yeah. And what I want is I want to have every single fee earner in my business. I want them to have a robot working for them in a PA advisory assistance function yeah. at some point in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, that's what I have. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're just about to kick off. Uh, we're just about to kick off a proof of concept with, a, with, a, with the largest RPA, robotic process automation firm in the world, to go and deploy robotic licenses to go oh, wow. and do a couple of different i won't go into too much detail if you don't mind because obviously look it's a little That's sensitive fine. right but to do two key functions uh in our finance function and in our research function um and listen i'd love to have a chat with you in hopefully three months time and maybe give you a little bit of a an insight into what what 
you know, what it looks like and, and is it as good as maybe some of the kind of business case that we thought was going to be. Yeah. The, just to simplify that, um, like what, what type of st- stuff are you trying to automate? And like to, to, to what, to what ends? Is it, is it administration? Is it the, the finding of the finding of, of data or the engagement of of said of said people or like is well let I'll, I'll, let me let me talk about it. I guess, let me talk about the I guess on the finance side of things. So okay. look, we have we have a we have a contract business right yeah. now that it's it's relatively small in comparison to I guess some of the, your your other listeners. But look, that contract business is uh, creates as you know a, a, like a mountain of paperwork or administration mm-hmm. on a weekly basis. Okay, so think about the whole the whole kind of initiative in terms of timesheet in timesheet approval invoice in invoice paid accounts payable you know VAT recollection VAT reclaim mm. and account, you know all that type of stuff now those pro- so you don't use a factoring company yeah well look we we have we have that capability but, okay. but clearly what we've got to go and do before a lot of that stuff happens is there's still there's still a large piece of of administration that happens here okay yeah to be able to roll up into, uh, we work at a company called Bot Back Office Support Services up in um, up outside Stoke, and but there's still a huge heap of work that needs to be done there, and all of that information is binary, right? Yeah. So the answer to it, or or, or you know the 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 the, uh, the action I should say to it, is either a one or a zero. So if it's a one, you do this. If it's a zero, you do this, and we think that we can probably automate 80 percent 85 percent of the stuff that comes in and out of our business on a weekly basis mm. now yeah look I bet you can. that that is that's not necessary that's not a that's not a headcount reduction exercise for us so we're... no it's a it's a focusing exercise so people can focus on the, the big ticket stuff that brings in fees big time but look here's the magic for us as we grow and scale it is 100% a recruitment prevention initiative. So we don't need to hire when the book grows from X to Y. We don't need to hire accordingly. And, and look, you know yourself, look, that's when, that's when impact on net profit really starts to, uh, to, to, to kind of really impact. So look, that's, that's part of, that's some of the stuff that we've, we've done ourselves, but that's the kind of focus that Adam has helped us kind of get to in terms of clarity and how, how will we be different uh, and where are we going to focus on and, you know, how we're going to kind of, you know, bring our team and bring all the, the brilliant people who work with us along on that bus journey, as I mentioned. Um, and, and, you know, people buy into that because it is hopefully a little different. Yeah, no, it sounds great. And um, so if we, uh, if, if we touch base again in a year's time, get you on, what's the world going to look like for you? Well, hopefully you'll be speaking to Rob McGee's robot, not Rob McGee. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> that, that would that would be that would be pretty good, eh? Um, hopefully, hopefully that'll be me chasing. It'll be my robot chasing an invoice because I've placed somebody with. Well, it. look, there you go. That's utopia. Robots talking <laughs> to robots, you know. I love it. But, All right, Rob, we're going to leave it there. Thanks so much for that, the chat. Um, I really enjoyed it you come to this from with with a whole different perspective and i like that you're obsessed with learning and trying new things and it sounds like well it sounds like we'll have lots to chat about the next time that we uh that we that we we catch up and do this again Delta, thanks a million love love what you're doing and continued success uh really appreciate your time take care all the best Hope you all enjoyed that interview with Rob McGee and he asked me to give a bit of a shout out that his company are hiring and are quite open to people being based remotely, you know, because they've got mature sales processes in place. And uh, yeah, so if you're looking for a remote recruitment role, then hit me up and I will introduce you to Rob. All right. Thanks very much. 
and I've got a ton of podcasts to get out. So stay tuned. Um, I've got a few more from our trip in New York and the videos on that are all on our YouTube channel. So jump onto the YouTube channel if you prefer the visuals rather than the audio. And we've got a few more local ones that we've been doing, but I just haven't had the chance to go and get it all done. But I'm catching up now. So thanks very much for tuning in again and please like, rate and subscribe. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.